Welcome guys to episode 4 of the Lycast series. Each episode, as I said before, we'll be covering the reliability engineering topics. If you haven't seen them yet, check out our previous videos um, on LinkedIn and YouTube and uh, enjoy. I'm your host, Chris Wynne jones and I'll today uh, be joined by uh, my colleague, Marius. Welcome, Marius. Yes, hello, I'm Marius Dombrowski and I work for Warsaw Poland office of HBK. Ah, welcome to the call. And today, our topic is going to be how does live data analysis work and how does it support failure modes and effects analysis? So we're going to kick into discussion, just open discussion about live data analysis. And we'll just go from there. So uh, hello, Marius, welcome to the call. And let's, uh, what do we know about live data analysis? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, actually, uh, live data analysis is a, a very good uh, method to uh, estimate your, uh, of course, live, uh, estimate the uh, time uh, to failure for your uh, product, for your uh, components. Uh, mostly we are talking about the uh, unrepairable components, yes. And uh, I think if you are a reliability uh, engineer, you, this would be the analysis that you know the best. Yes, live data analysis. Some some people call it Weibull analysis, but it doesn't have to be only the Weibull. Uh, we also uh, use very often uh, log normal distribution and uh, exponential distribution if we're talking about electronics, especially after uh, the burning burn burn in phase. Yes, <clears throat> so Weibull log normal distribution and exponential distribution. These are the three ones, uh, three main ones, uh, most often being used in, each uh, of in the this. distributions. Well, so to point out, each of the uh, distributions have uh, different characteristics. So uh, depending on what that distribution's intention is. Uh, so you've got uh, diff different uh, distributions when we're talking about um, exponential, we're talking about constant failure rate over time. And the, the others are a variable failure rate over time, which gives us uh, a distribution that um, is, a, is a curve. So we've got a distribution that fades, uh, changes over time. So you've got a, a population of um, expected failure and then uh, less expected uh, either end of that, that bell-shaped curve. And um, so uh, with Weibull analysis, we can see the distribution in different ways. So it's a multi, um, a multi um, purpose tool. So with Weibull, with there's three different categories. If you want to explain those, um, uh, linking in with that bathtub curve. Yes, a lot of yes, people yes. are familiar with the bathtub curve. Exactly. I was just thinking about it that, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned uh, the exponential distribution, and this is actually a pitfall that uh, many uh, companies fall into. Uh, it's, of course, easy to use. And, uh, you know, when you're using um, metrics, reliability metrics like mean time to failure, uh, mean time to uh, mean time between failure uh, or just failure rate, yes you are in fact using the exponential uh, distribution, which has this constant uh, constant failure rate, right? Uh, and with Weibull, what you just mentioned, Chris, yes, we can model more and actually uh, it's incorrect, yes, to model uh, something that uh, that is a wear out, for example, yes, so a failure mode that is a wear out or a component that is uh, exhibiting the wear out. Uh, or uh, infant mortality too, yes. It's incorrect to model it using the uh, MTBF and exponential distribution. So yes, indeed, you, you do have uh, this uh, bathtub curve uh, uh, where uh, the uh, failure rate is uh, initially, uh, with time, yes, initially it's uh, dropping. This is the infant mortality phase. Yes. Then you've got the uh, phase of the constant failure rate, which is the useful life. And then you have the uh, wear out phase. Yes. So yeah. uh, Weibull uh, is very nice to model this because 
and and this is how actually uh, mechanical parts or uh, electronic parts are behaving. Yes, so you you should uh, remember to take it into account. Uh, so uh, Weibull is very good for this because uh, with um, um, decreasing failure rate, you've got the beta parameter of Weibull, so the uh, shape parameter of Weibull uh, less than one. Yes, so that's that's very easy. Uh, for constant failure rate, you've got equal to one, and for wear out, you've got uh, greater than one. So, for example, yeah. uh, two, two and a half, and so on. When you're in, when we're in that useful life um, at the bottom, so you come down the bathtub curve, and you're into that useful life. Um, yeah. It's it's also within that that period of uh, a beta of one. Uh, th- this is where the random failures happen. So this is something we can't measure. You know, randomly something happens. So what you want to do ideally is to be either on the infantile, so you can uh, predict, um, encourage the failure, or you want to be on the wear out, uh, which is on the way out, and predict how long it's going to take before it fails. So you've got a good a good visibility of when it's going to fail in that wear out period. The piece in between, as I said, the useful life, yes, it is the useful life, but within that useful life on that flat line, you've got random failure scenario um, where it's, you just can't calculate it. You know, it's just, it's not, it's not ideal from a prediction point of view. Yes, yes, true. Uh, those those random failures usually just add to uh, wear out failures uh, because uh, what I have in my mind now is uh, uh, a a more realistic bathtub curve, you know, what uh, I just um, I described, uh, we both described, is a theoretical one. But in fact, this um, this time of the uh, constant failure rate and the useful life phase, it, it may not be even visible in a realistic bathtub curve, because it will look like this, that you, um, in reality, yes, uh, you will have the infant mortality and then you will not have a flat line here you will have slight increase so already some slight wear out and then it may uh, even go uh, further uh, mm-hmm. further up yes um so a lot more ideal if, to make predictions from even uh, so, so, so I- even this tells you that uh, you know using the MTBF only or the exponential distribution only is uh, um, not a good idea. I will just basically get uh, incorrect predictions. Uh, your let's say correctness uh, of prediction will strongly depend on the model that you select, on the statistical distribution that you select, uh, which. Yeah, if it's not, uh, again, electronics after burning, then um, you should use um, other distributions, yes, like Weibull, yes. like log normal. And also uh, it's worth to mention that Weibull with beta equal to one is the same as exponential distribution. So uh, um, uh, you can even, uh, you know, we can imagine that you can forget about exponential distribution just to use Weibull or log normal. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's brilliant. So, uh, so yeah, so we've got to that point. So we've got the live data analysis uh, model. So the data that goes into producing that model, uh, what data do we require? Yes, that's uh, very important. And actually, this is what uh, a lot of uh, reliability engineers are are struggling with to get proper data, uh, to get complete data um, uh, in a proper format, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, basically, uh, my recommendation would be to uh, have the data. And it's, uh, of course, an ideal situation that I will describe to you right now. You have the data on the level of uh, failure mode. Yeah? So uh, have uh, your failure data. That's the basic uh, input to live data analysis. Those failures should have uh, the failure mode or the, or the cause of the failure, if you will, um, assigned. And uh, you should know each row. You know, so so you've got the failure, you've got the time to failure, and you should know uh, what. Mm, uh, caused the failure. I'm uh, consciously, let's say, mixing right now causes and failure modes when we get to 
uh, FMEA, it may be uh, something different, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but at this point, you, you just, uh, it would be great to have uh, have this on the failure mode level. Uh, level. Also, it's important if you if you've got a component that uh, may be uh, produced in different versions, you should know the version of it. So the uh, configuration that you are uh, modeling. Uh, so would you say and, that changes the, uh, the the failure mode, um, identifying that as a different version of a product? I'm basically saying that the failure mode will. Uh, uh, it, it will be uh, the thing that uh, your model selection will uh, depend on. Uh, will, yeah. uh, so, so uh, you have a separate uh, model for different versions. Is that what you're saying? And uh, for different versions, yes, uh, yeah. absolutely, because they uh, they will be different products. Yes, I mean there there will be um, uh, there there will be uh, similar to one another. There, there will uh, probably uh, even uh, have the same function in the whole system, but uh, it will be a different version. So maybe even a slight redesign, but it may cause already a different, uh, um, let's say, uh, um, failure behavior. Yes, failure behavior. Yeah. So, and uh, if this is a new new generation product new generation uh, um, component, uh, we of course expect that it will uh, have less uh, failures, uh, it, that it will fail um, actually uh, later than uh, the previous product is. But of course, we know from reality, it may not always be uh, the case. So we uh, th th that's one of the reasons why we should do also the live data analysis to confirm that. How much, how much data do we need to calculate a usable model? So say we have a, we have in, a modified our product. We've got in-service data of our version one of our product. We've got test data of our version one and uh, it's looking fairly representative. And we have a version two because we want to improve uh, a situation that's uh, been identified in the version one. We've got a version two that's come along and it's yet to be released, but we need to test it. So to test it, I want to test it to failure. I want to know how it's going to fail. I understand my environment. Um, it's going to be the same environment, but it's going to um, it's been redesigned to uh, survive that environment. Um, uh, more successfully than my version one. So how much data would be enough data to, uh, you know, numbers of failures versus suspension data, uh, in your opinion? Yes, uh, I think it's best for, for this case to use our test design um, uh, module of Wabble Plus Plus, where you can um, basically uh, create a plot of how many units you need to test versus for how much time to prove that your target is uh, met. Yes, so your reliability target is met. Let's say the reliability target is 95% uh, uh, reliability at 10,000 hours uh, with 90% uh, confidence or with even 70% uh, confidence uh, some companies will use. Um, this you can use as an input and uh, perform a, a reliability uh, test design. And uh, it, it will show you that, for example, you will need um, um, six, j just an example, yes. Uh, you will need six units to be tested for, let's say, 5,000 hours. Yes? Another mm -hmm. thing is that, that you can apply here a, a Good example. accelerated Good example. life accelerated life testing you can apply, of course, but that's a totally different topic. Brilliant. So, so putting the story back together, we are we have a distribution. We've agreed our distribution. We've got some test data, and we then are, are going to calculate uh, from this distribution. So we need to pick a point in time in which we want to have our um, our predictions uh, forecasted. So that point in time would be um, the uh, expected usage period. So, uh, you know, say it's going to be used for 10,000 hours, then I want to know where I'll be in 10,000 hours time. 
uh, so I've got all that information brought together. So the what we can do then is we then calculate that based on the period of time uh, that I'm going to run this product for with this distribution. If I have a exponential data or a constant failure rate, then my predictions are relevant on what time um, for reliability. It's irrelevant when that time is because it's constant failure rate. Whereas if we use a different distribution, viable or log normal, we get a variable distribution over time, which changes and reduces uh, as it begins to wear out. So we have a more realistic prediction as to uh, the behavior of the product based on test data. So with that, we can calculate the reliability at a set time. So you mentioned uh, a requirement uh, a few minutes ago of uh, looking for a reliability of 90% at a X number of hours, X number of cycles, whatever unit it might be. Um, so we can do that, we can calculate that. So the second part of where we were going with the uh, discussion was how that then becomes useful in failure modes and effects analysis. Um, so with failure modes and effects analysis, me as a reliability engineer, I am looking for some understanding of occurrence of a known failure mechanism. That known failure mechanism, I have some understanding of physics of failure. Um, physics of failure is understood with durability and the durability side of things. Um, so the development engineers, the design engineers, the people doing the FE modeling, they can give me some understanding of what that physics of failure is uh, so that I understand how it fails. That how it fails becomes my understanding of my failure mechanism. That failure mechanism should tie up with test data, failure data, and my failure distribution, which then gives me some idea of occurrence. So that can then get fed into my failure mode effects analysis for my into my risk priority number. And my risk priority number is calculated off severity, occurrence, and detection. So my occurrence can be quite significant impact on that uh, final final score uh, for the risk value and to bring down that occurrence. So back on the previous comment of version one, version two of a product, my version two, I'm looking to make it more reliable. One way I can make it more reliable is to bring down the uh, occurrence and reduce that occurrence by increasing its reliability over time. So my RPN score gets better, my reliability goes up, and my product is then sent out to service with a mathematical prediction that it will improve that particular failure mechanism which I identified in my failure modes and effects analysis and gives my failure, failure modes and effects analysis then some uh, some weight uh, in its existence in uh, the need to do and understand those failure mechanisms. I mean if you agree with me there Marius so uh, do you want to uh, uh, add to that? No, I think I, I fully agree with you uh, there. And uh, uh, when it comes to uh, FMEA, I think you're a, a better expert than me. Um, <laughs> so, <you. laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so um, yes, yes, uh, fully, fully agree there. And uh, I'm guessing we'll be looking at how to exactly, uh, let's say, correlate maybe this uh, live data analysis with uh, the occurrence. Uh, and um, I'm also thinking about the uh, fMRA, which is a unique tool that we've got in our XFMEA uh, so, program. Yeah, you mentioned fMRA. I mean, that I'm looking for a another video to uh, discuss that. Uh, just keeping these videos short. Uh, but yes, right. fMRA. That is a plug for a new video. And um, so, thank you for bringing that up. So failure modes and reliability analysis. So that's uh, the how we bring things together and bring in this analysis into a failure modes and effects analysis uh, and tie the two together. So uh, so yes, thank you for bringing that up, Marius. It's, uh, yes, yes. It's, uh, actually, a nice, actually, a nice I, plug for the next video. <laughs> all right, that uh, sounds good and it makes sense. Yes, uh, we don't want uh, this uh, this video or any video to be <laughs> too long. Um, no, no. Uh, but I'll just add that I think <laughs> that um, uh, fMRA is uh, is let's say a new FMICA. Uh, 
uh, so instead of calculating the uh, criticality uh, here, uh, which may be misleading and uh, is not uh, from uh, our experience uh, reflecting the um, let's say the, uh, the the reliability of uh, the product uh, too well. Mm -hmm. Uh, here comes the fMRA yes uh, the R stands for reliability and we plug in uh, the reliability number so quantitatively uh, into the fMEA this one yeah but yeah just 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 an introduction for next topic that's fantastic yes absolutely so uh, so if Thank you. Um, so just summarising uh, what we've just discussed. So if you did get lost at any point, um, I can just uh, quickly summarise. So the life data analysis is the models in which we calculate the failure data versus if we have any suspension data. And with that information, we can calculate a failure model uh, distribution over time or we have a constant failure rate so it's it's either a distribution that changes different distributions for different purposes and we then fix a time in which we are interested in uh, so that might be the end life of the product the intended end life and see how reliable that product is um, on that distribution and then we take that data take that information um, to then understand and to uh, add that information to the failure modes and effects analysis to um, justify our occurrence so we can use that as justification for our occurrence because uh, traditionally the uh, severity occurrence detection are very um, i'll say uh, engineering judgment uh, in the past uh, so it's the knowledge of the person doing the analysis or the team doing the analysis and their their level of knowledge and understanding of the product uh, to decide whether or not um, the score that is scored against those items is uh, sufficient. And there is a danger of it uh, having no value um, and not being uh, of, of any use. Whereas bringing in the um life data analysis into the occurrence we certainly do set the occurrence up to to be of some value and something that you can improve over time so uh so yeah i think i can't caught everything there so yes that's how the two work together so um thank you very much marius thank you for your time and, of course uh, Thank you. I shall uh, see you either on the next video or in the future and uh, look forward to inviting you back. Thank you. Okay, thank you.